Okay, welcome back to, to the explanation of the delayed, co delayed choice quantum erasure. And so we had already previously gone over, you know, why when we take a measurement of an electron, we learn less about its momentum, or we know less about its momentum. That, that the electron has a randomization within that momentum change. It's totally random, unlike a billiard ball. If uh, Actually, I don't, I don't know if I mentioned this, but in the previous video, so I'm going to mention it now. If we have a billiard ball going in this direction, and we hit it with some other object, and it changes the direction, we can know exactly how much momentum has changed. It's not random. With an electron, when an electron goes, and it's bombarded with a frequency of photons, and the momentum is changed of the electron within this new range here. So this, this is a new range in which, that's a new range in which the electron was changed. It's random. It'll be anywhere along that new line which is why we can't make any prediction about it. Very strange. That should raise a whole new question in your mind. Why is the electron, why does the electron act so different than a large ball? The large ball, after all, the billiards ball, let's say an eight ball, is made up of a bunch of tiny components. All these components, electrons, photons, neutrons, they all, and, 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 and protons, they all have this property where, um, the randomness when the momentum is when you when you take a measurement of any of any take any measurement to learn its position, then you displace its uh, momentum, and it's random anywhere along this line here, and that's due to the kind of like the wave function of the particle itself. But even though it's acting like a particle, it still has that wave function behind it, that constant uh, we discovered here, that constant probability wave. Very strange. Yet the a ball is made up of a bunch of protons, and neutrons, and electrons. And even though it's made of a bunch of, you know, protons, neutrons, and electrons, it exhibits it exhibits different properties than the, the components in which it's made of. So these components, when they're all combined together in this larger component, that is when all these wave functions and probability so-called particles are existing uh, as some bigger thing, as some bigger function, then new emergent properties arise. Whoa, new emergent properties. Hey, you really want something cool? Check out. Uh, cellular automaton. Check out the game of life, which is cellular autom automation, and you're going to see that new properties arise from three basic worlds. Very interesting stuff. So that just shows how it's possible to have three basic properties give rise to new new properties, new rules that were not there, were not programmed in in the original thing. Okay, so how does all this make sense? Well, we have to look back at the original double slit experiment. So we have a photon emitter or an electron emitter. Doesn't matter. This thing is going to emit electrons one at a time. There's going to be a slit over here somewhere, very tiny, so that, the, that the electron is going to have to pass by really close to it, and it's going to have to go through one of those slits. Can't go through both simultaneously. Not if it's anything like a particle, right? And then over here, we're going to have an electric plate, and this electric plate is going to tell where the electron hit. Okay, so far, so good. So when we, when we, when we shoot the electrons, what happens is, they build up mostly here in between in the center as it well, let, you know to make this I'm going to make this more illustrative so instead what we're going to do is we're going to have let's exit that out we're going to have our electron emitter we're going to have our slits one here one here and our electric plate electrons are going to be shot in a straight line as if they're supposed to hit here, if they're anything like a ball or a bullet, they would hit right there between the two slits and they would never go through them. And then over here, we're going to have an electric plate which is going to determine where they build up. Well, what happens, and this is very strange, when you run this experiment, if you're not already familiar with it, the electrons build up mostly here. This is where more, and then they start to build up less likely, but they, they build up here and they build up less likely way out here. Well, wait a minute, that's an interference pattern. That's exactly what happened is if we, is if these, we weren't shooting electrons, but we were shooting freaking waves. And what happened is the waves would come out like that, and then when the waves would come out of here, they would crash in, and then they would start to come out here, like so, and they would begin interfering with each other. And as they interfered with each other, the greatest, you can already predict, the greatest place where those waves would hit, where the most pressure would hit, where they're building up and making it stronger would be here in the middle. And then they would interfere with each other in between those two areas, as you can see. They, they, they would 
they would uh, cancel each other out here, and so there would be no pressure hitting there. And then they would have some concentration here and here, and less concentration out here. That's what would happen. That's how you get the interference pattern. Well, that's how the damn electron acts. So this is very strange. What, what, what happens then, until we make that electron have to exist in some real way, to act like an electron, to act like a particle, it acts like a wave, a probability function. And so as the electron leaves, it leaves as a probability function. The electron doesn't exist anywhere yet. There's no electron because there's nothing to detect the electron yet. The electron plate is what's going to detect the electron. So here's what's so weird about this experiment. This experiment forces the electron to act as a probability wave. And so the probability wave is, and this, these aren't real waves. There's no real medium here. This is important to understand. These are probability waves. This is all mathematical function. In other words, if I were to build a digital process, like, like a, a slight reality machine with basic physics, I can, I, I under, we understand enough about waves to make them digital, to exist in a digital world. And I can run the sim simulation through a digital world, and all these waves wouldn't actually exist in any, in any real medium. They'd exist as a mathematical function, as a probability wave, and, and it would do all the calculations of what would happen if the wave hit two slits, and, and then they would come through and they'd interfere with each other. It would do all of that, all of that math, and it would know that, that it has to land here, here, here. Here it would land mostly, here it would land less likely, and then even less likely, right? So it would know all that, because I programmed it to have this probability function. So the electron is working as if there is a probability function underneath here being calculated by something is this is weird, huh? This probability, and this is what physicists say. This isn't me just making this up. This is real. It's shown by the, the Joseph's Junction in the last video. It, it's demonstrably real. That electron never actually went through that wall. It could be shown that it never went through that wall. It never disturbed the wall. It just appears on the outside of the wall, even though it was the function, the, the, the electricity was originally inside of here, because it didn't exist as electricity yet. It exists as a probability a wave function, a probable wave, and then it began to exist here outside the wall, so it never disturbed the wall, right? We went through that before. So here, the same thing is happening. It's leaving as a probability wave function, thus it never actually disturbs these, this wall here. This wall is never disturbed. You can shoot and bombard this wall with this electron freaking gun. You're basically shooting bullets. You're shooting little bullets. That's what we think we're shooting, right? That's what we should be shooting little bullets at this wall, bing, 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 but that's not what's happening. Instead, this wall is never disturbed by electricity. The electrons never disturb this wall because they don't exist yet. The electron only exists as this probability wave. The probability wave doesn't affect this wall because there's nothing to affect yet. It's just running the calculations, the probable, and, and, and it comes through here as a calculation, and it's only here that the electron is detected on the electric plate, and then we see an actual disturbance a real disturbance. This, this electric plate is actually disturbed because it registers a photon and bam, it registers it here most of the time. It registers it here less often and here even less often. Thus the interference pattern. Hopefully this is sinking in. Does this make sense now? Does the double slit experiment make sense now? I hope it does. And if the double slit experiment makes sense now, if you, can, if you understand this as a physicist, a physicist understands it, this is how a physicist understands it. The electron leaves as a probability function, as a Wave function, which is a probability, probable wave, not a real wave. All these calculations are made, so to speak, behind the scenes. It determines that it goes through both slits. That, that, is, that is, the waves go through both slits as a probability function. None of this is real. And only tell, the, tell it needs to be somewhere. Then, after the, after the function is complete, the randomization comes in. This is important. It must appear in one of these places, random. This line. Oh man, I hope, I hope this sinks in. This, this is so critical to understand what I'm about to say. This line right here, if we remember in the previous video, remember these lines in the previous video? I'm getting excited because this is exciting stuff, man. These lines right here, remember these? In the previous video, if you haven't watched the previous video, you need to go watch it. It's, it's vitally important. So watch the first video. Okay, those lines, remember those lines? So when, when we shot this electron out like this, and we shot the wave, you know, the, the, the photon, the light to, to determine exactly what that electron was, we disturbed its momentum, and, and, and its momentum is now changed to somewhere along this line, randomly. 
it's we know it's going to be somewhere along here, but it's going to be randomly. So it might it's going to have a greater chance of being here, less greater chance of being here, and they're going to be in whole steps. That's because remember electrons work in whole steps like that. They don't they're not a continuum like a line. They're not like this. To make a line, they they make steps like on your computer screen, and they appear in one, two, three whole steps. That's how they work. And that's why it's called quanta. The quantum world is called the quantum world because that's how particles act. They act in they act in quantums. They act in individual bits of information. They change from state one to state two. There's not an infinite amount of changes in between, which solves Zeno's paradox. But that's an, that's another thing. So, what's important to understand here is that there's a probability here now, and it, it, there's a greater chance it's going to be at that momentum, less greater chance at that momentum, and less greater chance at that momentum. And, and I'm, I'm doing I'm, I'm trying to make the analogy here to show, but that's how it works. There's 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 a greater chance it's going to be one speed, a slightly less greater chance it'll be a next speed, and those each of those steps are whole steps. They're not like 1.55678. They're one, two, three. They're whole entire steps, as if they're working on digital bits, as if the calculations are made to be simple and not complex, as if it's made to work like a computer. The probability wave function is working like a computer wave function, exactly like bits rather than in some continuum of infinites, which would be nearly impossible to calculate with any great accuracy. We can only approach infinites. Anyway, so. What's important to understand then, when this electron comes out, is this probability wave. Once we make a measurement, which is here on this electric plate, now we know exactly where it's at. It it's just like over here, like the one when, when the momentum changed. Then the result is, it's random. Where the photon ends up is completely random. We know it's gonna end up somewhere on here. There's an 80% chance it'll be here, and you know in the middle where the greatest concentration of electrons will hit, a less greater chance here, like let's say 40% and then 10% or something like that, right? But it gets less and less as, it go, as we go outward. But where it will appear anywhere within, within those regions, we know it won't appear here. There's a zero percent chance it'll, it'll appear in between those interference patterns. But it will appear here, 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 and with greater, greater uh, chance here. But where it'll end up is completely random. It might end up here, it might end up here. We only can know the probabilities where it'll end up. So does that make sense? If that makes sense, you can then begin to better understand the delayed choice quantum eraser. How is that? Well, the delayed choice quantum eraser, all it does is basically remove, what, what, remember once we put detectors here to know what slit the electron actually went through, once those detectors are there, guess what they're doing? They're making a measurement on the electron. What happens? We learn. What happens when you make a measurement on an electron? To learn its position. Once you make a measurement on an electron to learn its position, due to what? The Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, which shows to be true by the Joseph injunction and many other experiments, this experiment being included, there is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Heisenberg uncertainty principle says once you know its position, then it messes up what? What does it mess up? Well, we're using light waves here, right? The light waves slightly mess up the electron. And so what happens then is that um, it slightly messes up the momentum. And because it because it messes up the momentum, then we have a new momentum, and that new momentum is different than before. And so now, we, you know, we haven't broken the the uncertainty principle. So once you put this on, what happens? The particles begin to act like particles, and now they're going to land in one of these two spaces here and here. But which one of those two spaces will land in? We don't know. That's the uncertainty principle. This experiment, though it wasn't originally made for this reason was trying to break the uncertainty principle. It would have it if we had any other results. The reason why we get these results is because of the uncertainty principle. Uncertainty principle as, as I described before, and that's how you get these results here. And so the um, delayed choice quantum eraser it is basically the same thing. And even though you're bouncing off mirrors and all that, and you have entangled particles, it's still trying to figure out the position and momentum of a particle. And because you can't know the position and momentum of a particle, then what happens is you either get the interference pattern or you collapse the, the you, you collapse the probability pattern once you make a measurement. And when, when you collapse the probability pattern, then the particle begins to act like a regular particle. And ta-da, now it's acting like a regular particle. OK, hopefully this makes sense. I'm going to make another video because I need to explain the EPR paradox and other things to fully, really grasp the experiments. OK, thank you for watching. This is Neil. Bye. Oh, please click the thumbs up if you like the video.